All right, so in this series, we have covered a lot of information pertaining to arterial lines from basic info to the waveform, setup, insertion, and removal. For the last lesson in the series, I do want to talk about the assessment that we want to do for patients with these lines, as well as some troubleshooting techniques when you come across some issues. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. All right, and welcome back to another video lesson from ICU Advantage. My name is Eddie Watson, and my goal is to try to give you guys the confidence to succeed in the ICU by making these complex critical care topics easy to understand. I truly hope that I'm able to do just that, and if I am, I do invite you to subscribe to the channel down below. Make sure, though, you hit that bell icon so you never miss out when I release a new lesson. Also, to test your knowledge at the end of this lesson, head over to icuadvantage.com or follow the link down in the lesson description. Check your learning while also being entered into weekly gift card drawings. And then also don't forget that the notes for this lesson as well as all of the others are available to the YouTube and Patreon members along with some other great benefits. And you can find links to both of those down in the lesson description as well. All right, so with that out of the way, let's actually get in and start to talk about our assessment for patients with the arterial lines. And the first thing I wanna talk about is going to be your very first assessment. Now, there are a few things that need to be done as soon as possible at the beginning of your shift. First is you want to ensure that your alarms are on and appropriately set. So don't disable alarms that can alert you to life-threatening situations. Also, make sure the parameters for your alarms are within reason for your patient. So alarming too often when it's not really warranted can contribute to alarm fatigue and can lead to alarms being ignored. And then not alarming enough can lead to things being missed. So make sure that these are confirmed at the start of your shift and do update them as necessary. Along with this, you also want to evaluate the accuracy of your waveform and the values that you have. Now, as I did mention in the lesson talking about waveforms, that you want to make sure and perform a square wave test to check the proper level of dampening. And then lastly, at the beginning of the shift, you're going to want to make sure and zero and level your transducer. So let's actually talk about that one a little bit separately here. And these are two independent things, but are often associated together and oftentimes should be performed together, at least at the beginning of the shift. The first of these is going to be zeroing. And zeroing is the act of eliminating the impact of the atmospheric pressure on our arterial pressure reading. Now, theoretically, this should only need to be done once, but good practice is really to perform this at least once a shift. Essentially, what we do is we're going to provide atmospheric pressure to that transducer and tell the monitor that this is our zero reference. And one thing to know here is that the location of the transducer during the zero doesn't matter. The changes in atmospheric pressure from the ceiling in the room to the floor in the room is not even something that's noticeable. So how is it that we zero it? So very first thing, you want to hit silence on the monitor because you are going to get a red alarm when you do this. From here, go ahead and turn the transducer stopcock off to the patient and open to air. This is going to flatten your waveform and is what gives us that red alarm. Go ahead and remove the cap on the access port on the stopcock. Ensure that there's no movement or touching of that transducer. Then from here, you want to activate zero through your monitor. Now, obviously, this is going to vary depending on which type of monitor you have, but you do want to wait until you have zero over zero show on your monitor, and then at this point, replace the cap on the stopcock and turn it back off to the open port. Doing that, you will then have a properly zeroed transducer. Next, we want to level the transducer. And leveling plays a very important role when it comes to the accuracy of our blood pressure reading. Now, our goal is to maintain the appropriate height of the transducer in relation to our patient. And even minor changes to the position of the transducer can actually have big impacts on our readings. For every 10 centimeters, so about four inches, of difference in height, we will see a 7.4 millimeter of mercury difference in our reading. So if the transducer is below the proper level, we're actually going to see a higher pressure than what it actually is. If the transducer is above the proper level, then we're going to see a lower pressure. So we do need to ensure that we maintain the proper height of the transducer and then adjust its position with position changes for our patient. So here, think if you've lowered the bed, but you didn't move the transducer, 
pressure, it's now going to be much higher than it was, giving you a falsely low blood pressure reading. This could lead to improper treatment. At the same time, if you raise the bed, the transducer is now going to be too low, giving you a higher blood pressure reading. So again, this could lead to improper treatment, but it could also mean that while you think your patient's blood pressure is fine, they're not actually perfusing tissue properly. Now, the place that we do the leveling is something that we call phlebostatic axis. In the past, some places would actually level at the insertion site, but really for the last 20 plus years that this has been the landmark that most people use. Now, the landmark for a supine patient lying on their back is going to be the fourth intercostal space measured at the sternal border and then mid-axillary line. This is the point that we are going to level our transducer to. Now, phlebostatic axis is the physiological marking of the level of the right atrium. Now, in the case of the arterial line, we really want to have the same height as the aortic root, which is where the aortic valve and the aorta come together. Fortunately for us, the right atrium and and the aortic root are at similar heights. And typically, we are going to have this transducer attached to an IV pole to prevent accidental movement, but really it could be anywhere as long as its position and level are monitored based on what's going on with the patient and where their position is. Now, from here, let's actually talk about our routine assessment. So along with the beginning of your shift, there are some periodic assessments that need to be done with the arterial line. The frequency of these assessments will depend on your facility's specific policy. So these could be hourly assessments every two hours or at least every four hours. So for this routine assessment that you do want to make sure that you are doing a level and a square wave test. So you don't need a zero at this point, but both of these take just a second to do and really should be any time you're doing an assessment of the line. You also want to do an equipment check. So ensure that your pressure bag is properly inflated. Make sure you have saline left in your bag. Check your stopcocks for proper positioning. Make sure all stopcock open ends have the caps on them. Ensure that there's no air bubbles in the tubing, and then make sure all connections are secure. From here, we want to move on to a site assessment, and we want to make sure that our arterial catheter and insertion site are intact and looking good. So we want to be looking for any bleeding, bruising, or hematomas. Make sure that the dressing border is intact and that the bio patch is in place and properly positioned. We also want to make sure the catheter and any tubing are secure, as well as we want to be monitoring for any signs of infection. And this would be things like redness, swelling, or purulent drainage. After assessing that, we want to move on to our patient assessment, and the main thing here is going to be performing a neurovascular assessment. And so here, think of the five Ps. Pain, pulses, pallor, paresthesia, and paralysis. So here, pain, we want to be assessing for any at the insertion site or distally to our catheter. For pulses, we want to check both our pulse and capillary refill. Now, with radial and pedal A-lines, that assessing a distal pulse is not going to be possible, so so we really want to make sure we have a good cap refill. Pallor is pretty self-explanatory. Paresthesia, this is the abnormal sensation, often something like a tingling, prickling sensation, and then paralysis. And then finally, we also want to be assessing the frequency of any changes that we need to do. So you are going to need to change out things like the bag of saline, pressure tubing, a transducer if that's separate, as well as the dressing. Again, the frequency of these changes are going to vary based on your facility's policy, so do make sure you know those. But these often vary from every 72 hours, every 96 hours, every seven days. So again, it just really kind of varies. You do want to ensure though that everything is timed and dated, but do know that the catheter itself is not something that we routinely change out. And then remember, if the dressing is no longer intact, you want to make sure and change it out to ensure that you do have a proper barrier in place to prevent any potential infection. So with the discussion of the assessments out of the way, I do want to cover some troubleshooting issues that often come up. Now, the first potential issue that you could come across is going to be if you are unable to flush the catheter. In order to troubleshoot this, you want to do things like checking the stopcock positions, make sure that they are off to the open port. You want to ensure that you have enough pressure in your pressure bag. Also, you can check for any kinks, bends, or pinches in the line. And then lastly, this could also be related to a clot in the catheter itself, and in this case, it would require a new one to be placed. Now, another issue to potentially troubleshoot is going to be having no pressure reading on your monitor. So if you have this going on, you do want to ensure that the tubing is attached to the arterial catheter. 
This can lead to significant bleeding. Once again, check the stopcock position and make sure that those end caps are in place. If it is turned off to the patient or the transducer, you will have a zero reading on the monitor. If it's off to just the transducer and the cap is not on the open end there, that this can also be a site for your patient to bleed out from. Also check if your cable going to your monitor has become disconnected. It's not always obvious. Sometimes it's just out of place a little bit, so make sure each connection point is plugged in all the way. Usually when this happens, though, you'll get dashes showing up on the monitor, or sometimes even the whole pressure section will be removed from the display there. And then also ensure that you do have the pressure channel turned on on your monitor as well, as that would lead to you not seeing the readings up there. Another issue to troubleshoot is going to be bleeding. So if you notice bleeding, especially significant bleeding, that this could be life-threatening. So check and make sure that your tubing is connected to the arterial catheter, check those stopcocks and the end caps and ensure that they're set to be off to the open port and that those caps are present. If you're troubleshooting bleeding that's coming from the insertion site, that this can sometimes be caused by patient movement. So you might want to consider the use of an arm board or immobilizing that limb. Do also so check your coagulation studies and your patient's platelets. Patients who are on a heparin drip or some other anticoagulant drip may experience significant bleeding and require frequent dressing changes. And you may consider doing a pressure dressing over the insertion site to try and help cut down on some of this bleeding. Now, another thing to potentially troubleshoot would be a backflow of blood in the tubing. So once again, check those stopcocks and end caps for proper positioning. Now, if that stopcock gets turned off to the transducer in that cap, cap is not present, this can lead to backflow of blood and bleeding out of that open port there. You also want to check for a disconnect in the system above the area where you notice the backflow. So if a connection came undone, this would essentially be the same effect as the stopcock being open to air. Also make sure that you have enough pressure in your pressure bag uh, and that you do have sufficient fluid in there as well. The backflow that we usually see with this in these cases is pretty minor, but having the proper pressure or fluid to move forward, if that's not there, you can start to see a backup of blood in the line. All right, the next thing to possibly troubleshoot is going to be having an overdamped line. So remember, overdamped means loss of energy, so a flatter waveform. Now, the first quick easy thing to check is to see if the scale on your monitor has changed. If the scale has become too large, it can make a normal sized waveform appear small and dampened. So rescale your monitor if needed. Hypotension, especially profound hypotension, is often gonna mimic an overdamped waveform. So do a square wave test quickly, make sure that you are getting just one, two oscillations and that you have an optimally damped setup. Also, if it is optimally damped and your patient is just hypotensive, you can rescale the waveform on the monitor and this will help it to appear a little bit more normal. Other potential causes to troubleshoot in this situation would be checking if you have extensions on your pressure tubing, could be too long of a pressure tubing, check for any air bubbles in the line, check for any kinked, bent, or pinched tubing, ensure that you do have enough pressure in the bag and that there is fluid remaining in that bag, check for any partially turned stopcocks, and then also check the arterial catheter positioning, so the positioning of your patient's wrist for those femoral lines, sometimes hyperextension can actually flatten that vessel. And then finally, this could also be the result of a thrombus at the tip of the catheter. Uh, if this is the case, that this may require a new catheter. Another issue to troubleshoot would be if you are having a underdamped waveform. So here, underdamped, think increased energy, so more exaggerated waveform. So for this, you want to check for any air on the line, remove any extra tubing or unnecessary stopcocks. Do evaluate the size of the catheter that's used. A small bore catheter can also lead to this. And then finally, just know that this could be the result of hyperthermia, tachycardia, and really high cardiac output states as well. And then finally, the last bit of troubleshooting that I want to cover is if you notice either very high or very low systolic and diastolic readings on your monitor, especially suddenly. So first, you want to check your transducer position and ensure that it is leveled at phlebostatic access. If it is, go ahead and re-zero the transducer and then do a check for damping with the square wave test. If all of that checks out and you've done the troubleshooting for over or under damped of your waveform, then this is probably an accurate reading and then you need to treat it as such. All right, so that finishes up this lesson here talking about our assessment and then some of the troubleshooting that you guys will need to do for an arterial line. 
And that's also going to finish up this series talking about arterial lines. I really hope I was able to cover a lot of good information for you guys. There's a lot of stuff that I covered over the course of these lessons. So I really hope that you guys did enjoy this. If you did enjoy this lesson as well as any of the others, please do leave them a like on here. Uh, it really helps to let YouTube know to show this content to other people who haven't seen it yet. I love reading the questions and comments that you guys leave for me. I try to respond to just about everybody out there. If you haven't done so already, do consider subscribing to the channel. That way you always catch the latest videos as I release them every week. If you do want to learn more about this topic or anything related to critical care, do head down to the video description and I have links to some of my favorite books on the subject down there. Uh, you can also check out some links to some other things and check out some awesome t-shirt designs that I have down there as well. Finally, a shout out to the awesome YouTube and Patreon members out there. The support that you guys show me truly means the world to me and a big thank you to you guys. Now, for the rest of you, if you'd be interested in additional support for this channel and want to get extra content that only members receive, then you can either join the YouTube membership down below or head on over to the Patreon page and check out some of the ways to show support over there. Don't worry if you don't though, as your support here and just watching these videos and sharing them with others is greatly appreciated as well. And until I see you guys for the next lesson in the next series, here's a couple of great videos for you guys to check out. As always, thank you so much for watching. Have a great day.